both Balins and also Miklush as discussed. Uh, I have to say that all three authors also have worked a lot about uh, post-socialist transition. Uh, they also uh, are working on political capitalism and all of them uh, you know, will be in public choice society in March uh, in US. Uh, and there will be a workshop uh, presided by Miklush on this issue in which will be participating Miklush, uh, Balins, both Balins and uh, also uh, Holcomb. And uh, I think another colleague uh, of Corvinus University. So that will be a very uh, excellent opportunity to promote uh, studies and uh, you know, um, uh, investigation about political capitalism. I hope very much that uh, we will be able to coordinate some work with Miklush by, with my great pleasure on the issue of political capitalism uh, at a world level. And uh, we have a very uh, close collaborative relationship with uh, Miklush and also the University of Corvinus, which we think and we hope will keep with the cap given by uh, Janusz Korna for his honor. And uh, for two days, we have this pleasure to listen to a predation, different type of predation in terms of corporate raiding uh, by, uh, by uh, Balint and Balint. Um, on, on this issue uh, the, from a paper published in Public Choice and then uh, for 45 to 50 minutes and then uh, a, a discussion, a review of the paper by Miklush for 15 minutes. Um, then uh, you can respond to uh, critical view or assessment, critical assessment of Miklush and then we will open the floor to the public uh, for um, uh, eventual comments or uh, you know, questions that can be raised uh, you know, um, in, related to your paper and the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, you, know, you can start uh, your talk uh, and if you need uh, you know, the PowerPoint as you do, uh, it can be uh, you know, organized by the organized. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. Uh, yeah, just a second, and uh, you should be seeing this. Are you seeing this, the presentation? Yes, very fine. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, and thanks for the invitation. We were very happy to accept it. I'm Barit Modlovich. I will be starting this presentation. Uh, I will be, first of all, giving a theoretical exposition on, on uh, what we mean by predation, how we interpret predation and the predatory state, the functioning of it, and uh, what kind of uh, post-communist forms of predation we are trying to integrate into the predatory state framework of public choice literature. So this is what I'm going to explain, and then Balint will follow, the other Balint, and he will follow up with further insights and uh, some examples uh, from the case of Hungary, some empirical cases to illustrate everything uh, that I'm going to now talk about. Now, first of all, let me start by pointing out that predation and the idea of the predatory state has been present in two different branches of literature. Now, both of these branches are very elaborate. They are very rich. They have very well-developed ideas in uh, what predation means and how uh, the predatory state functions, but they have, developed, they have developed separately. They have been largely detached from each other. And apparently there is little interest in the two branches to integrate the insights of one branch into the other and to somehow uh, mix the two and somehow uh, exploit the synergies between these two, these two uh, uh, branches of literature and us. And this is what really uh, struck us as a, as a gap in the literature, because as we are specialized in post-communism and the post-communist countries, we were well aware of the post-communist literature and wanted to integrate some insights into the public choice. So these are the two branches, as you can see on the slide. And let me start by uh, um, explaining the differences between the two, because as I said, they, uh, um, they develop differently. And of course, their understanding of predation and more importantly, their approach to the predation and the predatory state is different. In the public choice literature, uh, the understanding of predation is universal. Predation is understood as a feature of every state. Basically, that was the idea put forward by North in his uh, 1981 work, 
when he said that uh, the general idea of the state is a contractual theory. In, very often in mainstream economics literature, what uh, you can see is that uh, the state is there to provide public goods and to create, uh, not to create, but to, uh, uh, to correct market failures. Now, uh, what North says that there might be another view, that we might just want to change our perspective on the state and we might, not, might just start thinking of it, not as a provider of public goods, but as an institution primarily interested in reorganizing ownership, in extracting resources and redistributing resources from one group to another. So that was the basic idea that stop looking at the state or thinking of the state as an agent of the public good, uh, but to think, as a, think of the state as an expropriatory institution. That was the, so the, the predatory state in this understanding is basically an interpretive framework. So it's not a different type of state or a variant of state, but it's the state as such understood as a predatory institution. And uh, well, uh, the whole branch of public choice literature since then has proved that this view can be quite fruitful. Professor Wahabi's paper, uh, Positive Theory of the Predatory State, um, exemplifies that by uh, saying that if we look at the theory of state space, so to the list of activities carried out by the state, then uh, we will uh, we will see that it does not conform to does not conform to the uh, the uh, uh, to the mainstream theory of the state because then the state should be committed only to provide to the providing of public goods and the things that uh, mainstream economists would say that that's the state uh, that's what the state should be doing but instead the state takes over not what it should but what it can and. Uh, it uh, it uh, uh, basically um, so takes into account various uh, aspects of mobility and uh, and appropriability, and so the state acts as a predator, not as a public good actor. So this is basically the public choice framework, thinking of, about the state as a predator, uh, about every state. Now, the public choice literature is something entirely different. Not entirely, but in its approach, it's quite different because it is not universal, but it's particular. It's not interested in every state or the, the description of every state, but when it speaks about predation, it's interested uh, in predation as a feature of some states. So in the post-communist literature, the predatory state is an independent state type. It's a type of state, not, a, not of every state. And it says that the state becomes a predator. It becomes a predator as its power is used for illegal appropriation of productive assets for private gain. So not every type of uh, state activity is understood in the predatory, in the predatory framework, but all, only certain new ways of state functioning, which have emerged uh, in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And these are, this is basically the uh, general difference between these two branches. That the public choice literature is interested in reinterpreting the van ways of state functioning, whereas the post-communist literature is interested in exploring the new ways of state functioning. And uh, these new ways are what we want to integrate into the public choice framework because public choice is interested in taxation, nationalization, these van ones. And we would like to add what the Russians called radiastvo. Radiastvo uh, means, uh, that derives from the English word rating, and corporate rating, but it means something something different, as you can see, uh, or as I will uh, I will like to explain, because it can be defined as it was on the previous slide on the previous slide as a illegal appropriation of productive assets. So that use of uh, power, uh, coercive power, to appropriate companies to to appropriate non-monetary property for private gain. So it's different from normal uh, nationalizations, for example. And when it's taken into public use, to use this term, which uh, Richard Epstein uses in his book, Takings, when he speaks about eminent domain, he says, taking into public use. So that, for example, a state takes over some, uh, some lands to build roads on it. But then the, the road is not leading to, uh, to the house of the politician uh, uh, per se. So it's not for his private gain, but it's for, for, it's for public use. Now, in, in the case of Radiastro, it's always about private uh, private gain, appropriation of companies for private gain, initiated by various types of actors. And this is the table which can summarize uh, different kinds of uh, predation. Just very briefly, the, uh, the three types of uh, radiars for, uh, are, uh, which are, which can be seen on the left of the table, which are black rating, gray rating, and white rating. Now, black rating 
is the type of uh, radius for or takeover of a company uh, by, uh, by physical violence. So the use of physical violence. This is typically done not by the state itself. So this kind of predation is not initiated by the state itself, but by the organized underworld, by criminals who would like to take over certain companies for themselves. And this mainly can happen when the state is weak, when the state cannot prevent the, uh, the such actions, when, when the state cannot protect property rights, and then uh, such uh, black rating actions can be initiated. The gray rating is the, is the type of action, is, is the type of radius for when uh, the state institutions are not weak anymore, they, uh, they, the regulatory institutions, tax office and the like, they have considerable power over the people, but the central government doesn't really have power over these institutions. So it's the central government that cannot control its apparatus and the apparatus starts using its own power for registro and for taking over companies. So, and this can be done uh, uh, basically uh, in two ways, they can, do, they can do it for their own uh, private gain, or they can um, perform this as a service, as a service of rival entrepreneurs or oligarchs. And now I'm coming from the right to the left of the table. I started from when the initiator was the organized underworld, and now I'm talking about when, uh, when the initiators uh, or client of corporate trading are rival entrepreneurs or oligarchs who basically hire, basically hire these uh, tax officials or policemen or fire workers or, uh, or uh, um, basically any kind of uh, any kind of person with uh, state authority to abuse that state authority. And in, indeed, uh, in uh, in uh, in the Russian literature, there is even uh, there can also be found a list of activities uh, which were there for sale, basically. So it was said that if you want. For example, an inspection of a target firm by taxing agencies. Yes, you can do that for $4,000. There you go. You pay it, you get it. Or you want the opening of a criminal case against target owners. Yes, you can do it. You can have it for $50,000. We can do it. You want to arrest the, your business competitor. Yes, you can do it for $100,000. We will do it for you. So basically, this is the, this is the gray rating stage. When the rating is, as I said, uh, carried out by a uh, mid-level, lower middle-level public authority uh, um, who are hired by rubber entrepreneurs or oligarchs, but they can also do it for their own sake. There are cases described like this when policemen, for instance, raid certain uh, company offices and uh, take over the necessary documentation from the company to, uh, to, uh, to change its ownership to uh, family members and people close to the police station and the police man. So this is also a kind of a predation initiated on this middle level. Now we are coming to the third type, the white trade. White trading is when the strong, uh, state is strong and predation is initiated not by the organized underworld, but by the organized upper, by the uh, top level public authority using, uh, um, using the legislature itself and using uh, different uh, state institutions itself. And this is uh, where we start, uh, where we um, uh, come from the failed state, basically the kind of state where uh, this kind of riders for activities are initiated by organized uh, criminals into when the state itself becomes a criminal from a, from a situation which is a multi-pyramid uh, power network when there are multiple actors competing in the state and there are multiple creditors in the state and try to take over uh, companies in an uncoordinated way to a situation when there is a single pyramid power network headed by a chief patron. It's a patron network, single pyramid patron network. And he is the one who initiates this kind of, this right there. So he is the one who has an own, uh, what we call an adaptive political family and uh, who uh, takes over companies, private enterprises, using political power and using the state power to move them to the ownership orbit of his own adaptive political family. So this is the kind of, this is the white trading uh, uh, case. And um, this is also uh, uh, the case that we are going to call a central led corporate trade. Central led corporate trading, which involves white and gray trading techniques as well. So very often uh, the tax office is used and, uh, and other offices, Bant, are, Bant is going to be talking about this. Now, how this kind of uh, 
activity, because these activities are quite different from a normal taxation and nationalization carried out by states normally in Western societies, for example. So how can we integrate this kind of center-led corporate trading into the model of, uh, into a public choice, uh, public choice model? And well, we started from, uh, from, the, uh, from a paper by Peter Leeson, who uh, tried to uh, have a model of, um, of basically a predatory state, as he calls it, or of predation. And his question was, will a rational proprietor overturn their tenants? So basically his uh, question, or Basically, he, he debated an earlier idea. Earlier, people had said that um, a proprietor won't uh, predate on his tenants because the tenants can leave. And so the thing is like, uh, uh, it's uh, um, so treating the tenants badly is just as bad idea as treating any customer badly because the customers will leave you, they have the option of exit. And, but Lisa says that uh, the proprietor might have enough power to prevent exit. And therefore, if you, uh, um, work out the, the, the maths and you work out the game theory of it, then you will see that predation is indeed rational from the proprietor. That was Leeson's, uh, that was Leeson's argument. Now, what we did is to look at the background axioms, the background axioms of Leeson, and to see how his model is appropriate for, uh, for taxation, for the, uh, for the predation understood this, uh, 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 let me say this conventional way of uh, predation and how these uh, presumptions uh, um, are not there or how these presumptions do not work for central led corporate trade. But first of all, Leeson works with an unconstrained non-elected ruler. So there is a ruler who, uh, where, uh, who, can, who, have predate, who has predatory intentions. He, can, he wants to uh, uh, predate on his tenants and the tenant's only alternative is exit. So they cannot vote him out of power. That's, that's one point. Now, in, case, in the case of central led corporate trading, when Raidas was initiated by a chief patron, then it's, it is an unconstrained ruler. So one who can uh, predate on his, uh, on his uh, subjects, but he's also elected. So he has to take into account certain political costs, which can come from different kinds of damages uh, which, uh, which stem from taking over a company, like social damages, e nationwide economic damages, or political damages. If, if there, is, there are so great, uh, 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 or if the, if the takeover is so scandalous that it might cause political damage. So he has to consider uh, this. Secondly, Leeson, in, the, in the case of Leeson, uh, predation was taxation. Now taxation is intermittent takeover of renewable sources of homogeneous property like money or plantation products uh, and, and so on and so forth. And therefore he uh, has repeated deals with a homogeneous mass of people. So basically his understanding, and this is why he uses this kind of game theory approach and an infinitely repeated game, because uh, in his model, the, uh, uh, um, the predation takes over again and again and again and again on the same people who can decide whether to leave or not, uh, and so on and so forth. In the case of central corporate trading, there is nothing like this. There, there is no, re no renewable or homogeneous property, but a single company. Uh, and therefore, uh, what has to be taken into account is the company's market value, and also uh, how this market value can be boosted once the company is taken over. Barnett is going to talk about this uh, more. And also there are no repeated deals, but one take. So it's not that there is, there is a homogeneous mass of people on whom constant taxation is done, but there is a single company, a single takeover, which they want to take, uh, which, uh, which, the, uh, which the chief patron wants to uh, um, redistribute to his, own, uh, to his own clients. And that's why what he has to take into account here is the ability of resistance. So how resistant the company can be, how mobile it can be, and how appropriable it is, these are the... Uh, uh, aspects raised by a professor Wahabi in his, in his paper. So basically what, uh, uh, what we say is that the predator doesn't have to solve an infinite repeated game, but has to do a cost benefit analysis. So, and can say that predation is rational if the, well, if the costs are bigger, uh, or sorry, if the benefits are bigger than the costs. So if the company's market value and the boosted market value and uh, the political gains, sometimes there are political gains as well of taking over a company, these are bigger than all the costs and the, the possible resistance of the company. So basically a single company is, uh, is taken over 
by, by central means and central led corporate trading. Usually, and this is my last uh, uh, thought, usually when, uh, uh, when, uh, when predation in these post-communist settings is carried out only for monetary gain or for economic gain, then usually big companies are chosen and taken over and the small companies are, are, left, are left alone. So that's the, that's the usual uh, setting. That's, uh, that's what uh, Professor Zoltan Balog in the 1970s called as uncollectible surplus value. So he had uh, this Marxist language and he said that uh, basically what is, what is happening is that uh, the, the uh, collection or the takeover itself would be more costly than the, than the, than the value which can be derived from the takeover. And uh, basically, this is this is very often what happens, and this can explain why certain companies are taken over and certain other companies, uh, or maybe some industries, are are left alone. So this is uh, this is our model. Here is the right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, and now let's go and uh, to have a look at the process of predation, and we, we wanted to model it. Uh, uh, we think that it's really like uh, in the nature when a, when a lion is uh, trying to catch a gazelle uh, uh, and looks on the herd that what are those uh, members of that herd uh, which would be uh, the most rational uh, to seize them. Uh, so uh, the predation process has practically three phases. Stalking phase, the hunting phase and the consuming phase. The stalking phase, when, uh, when they try to uh, calculate that uh, the value uh, of a company uh, or an asset, uh, uh, what is on the market, and we call it unmolested value or unmolested market value, which means that uh, uh, these companies uh, 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 has to face only normative regulations and not discretionary ones uh, uh, concerning their operation. And then uh, 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 <coughs> the uh, 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 predator uh, uh, thinks over that what would be the forecasted value uh, of, this, uh, of this prey uh, af uh, after the hunting phase. And what determines uh, the forecasted value is on one hand, the cost of hunting down uh, this given prey, and the other thing is the uh, calculation of the forecasted uh, corruption potential after seizing this prey. Of course, the, uh, uh, the price of the uh, uh, target company uh, can be pushed down if uh, um, there are uh, uh, satisfactory means of coercion to push down the price of it, uh, blackmailing and even uh, uh, other uh, other ways of uh, of uh, uh, diminishing the market value of the given company. Uh, uh, this can be on several ways. For example, bringing discretional regulations, uh, 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 narrowing the scope of operation of that company. Uh, uh, threatening them, threatening their partners uh, from certain positions and, uh, and so on. So when uh, uh, at the end of the stalking phase, the target company uh, is selected, then comes the hunting phase. The hunting phase is like in a normal mafia, it's going uh, to give an offer, uh, uh, which is unrefusable, but uh, uh, it can happen that still uh, the target if target company, the owner of the target company refuses this offer, then there are other means of state coercion with which uh, they try to, in quotation mark, convince, uh, convince uh, the owner to uh, get rid of the company. And, uh, uh, and during the hunting phase, uh, uh, it can be that the price with which they can seize this company even is lower and lower as a result of this uh, unequal fight uh, uh, or using the um, well, non-violent uh, uh, means of state coercion. And when the hunting phase is over and is done, the company uh, changed, uh, uh, changed uh, uh, the owner, 
it can be also uh, uh, not a direct change uh, to another private owner, but uh, uh, we use the category in our book, uh, um, in our book that uh, uh, this is a uh, transit nationalization, which means that the state nationalizes that company and then privatize uh, within the sphere of the political uh, 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 political family uh, 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 to finding a new owner who is in the uh, higher regions of the adopted political adopted political family. So when this is changed, then comes the search phase, the so-called consuming phase, when they want to realize uh, uh, realize the <coughs> the advantages. Uh, Normally, in most of the cases, the, the newly sized uh, uh, enterprise company is not operated uh, uh, among uh, uh, neutral market uh, market relations or uh, market relations, but then they use uh, uh, a lot of other uh, means uh, uh, how to raise the value for the new owner with corrupt methods, corrupt methods and the uh, concrete helps of the state power uh, for the new owners. So this is the, uh, this is the general model, uh, general model. And when uh, uh, we see that uh, the value of a company, so-called market value is considered to be the unmolested market value at the beginning of the stalking phase. And then during the hunting phase, it goes down when the value of the company is the, uh, for the original owners, it's, it is the uh, uh, value molested, uh, molested, and then when it says for the new owner, then uh, it's the booty value of the company, which means that the, in a relational economy, when not pure in quotation, or not pure market relations uh, 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 define the real value of a company, but but the new owner's relation uh, to those uh, uh, people in to both people in politics uh, who has uh, uh, power to bring discretional rules, uh, discretional treatment, uh, uh, a positive discretional treatment uh, for that company. And this is what we call the consuming phase. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, on this base, uh, we can make a difference uh, uh, between the everyday corruption uh, uh, and uh, 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 which uh, can characterize the corrupt states, corrupt states where uh, uh, the normal corrupt transactions uh, has a <clears throat> very simple mechanism. Normally, uh, 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 a corrupt provider, uh, one corrupt provider is involved in the business. These businesses are occasional ones, uh, the partners, uh, the partners enter into business uh, voluntarily, and uh, after uh, each business, they uh, they can leave freely as the business is finished. And of course, uh, uh, the corrupt cases in every, on the level of everyday corruption, uh, uh, they can be very widespread, but they do not uh, uh, do not uh, lead are not led uh, from a central place or or, high, or higher hierarchies. Uh, of the of the state, the second level is when we can speak about captured state, when when uh, uh, oligarchs or organized crime organizations uh, uh, capture this or that component of the state, uh, 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 middle and very rarely high level uh, uh, politicians and those who are active in in uh, public uh, uh, public services, uh, then uh, uh, we can witness already uh, some. Uh, Permanent uh, uh, or temporarily permanent uh, uh, vessel chains in this in this society, but even in this case, uh, who orders the corrupt actions are normally oligarchs or members of the uh, different criminal organizations who who corrupt or blackmail people uh, in the uh, public public sphere. But in the case of a criminal state. Uh, uh, where the uh, amplitude of arbitrariness uh, is the is, is the widest, which means uh, that uh, the state is operated as a criminal state from above, 
from a monopolized position. This is when we are speaking about criminal state, about a single pyramid uh, uh, power structure, power structure, and if uh, 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 this criminal state is operated by a clan type uh, ruling elite, uh, uh, what we call adopted political family, then we speak about a, a, a mafia state, then the organizer and monopolist of the corruption process is the, the chief patron who is normally the president or the, or the prime minister, prime minister of the country. So he is at the same time in a, the highest uh, uh, formal executive position and the highest informal position as the head of uh, the adopted political family of a clan, in of a clan where you do not have a voluntary um, uh, entrance uh, uh, and you cannot voluntarily leave it. Uh, uh, you can be only adopted and pushed out or also to have an authorized, authorized uh, uh, permission to leave uh, uh, if it's allowed by the chief, chief patron. So on the level of the criminal state, uh, the 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 wideness uh, of the of the uh, uh, of the uh, corruption action it means that the state uh, different organs of the state on a higher uh, on a highest level uh, uh, on a concerted way are operated as a criminal organization the executive power the legislative power the chief attorney's office the tax office the state account office the uh, 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 and and other uh, other uh, institutions of this uh, uh, of this society so now if we take a few examples for that you know then then uh, 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 we are just uh, try to list a few uh, a few cases esma was an outdoor advertising company owned by uh, Spanish and Hungarian owners. Uh, uh, it, uh, uh, the main assets of this company was, uh, was uh, 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 that, they, uh, that they had a possibility to use the lamp posts in the capital Budapest and to hang out uh, uh, posters, posters there. Uh, uh, the owner of uh, uh, this company uh, uh, was invited to the uh, Fidesz-led Ministry of uh, uh, Economy, and he got an offer uh, in quotation mark to sell his company to an other Fidesz oligarch, Fidesz-style oligarch. He refused uh, uh, this offer, and uh, at that time he got uh, 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 a lot of. Um, uh, examinations uh, from uh, uh, from the uh, national tax office, uh, even the chief attorney's office uh, uh, started actions against the company, but uh, the owner still resisted uh, uh, to give uh, uh, to give up his position in the in the company. And in this case, in this case, uh, the uh, Fidesz majority within the parliament brought a law which prohibited to have uh, posters and lampposts and the streets uh, referring that uh, that is dangerous for the drivers on the streets because, uh, 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 because they cannot uh, at the same time take care of driving and, and, and watching these posters, practically annulated the assets such a way of, 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 this, uh, of this company. After a few years, the owner gave up and sold this company, his company, uh, to the uh, to that oligarchs, which was appointed practically by the chief patron in Hungary. And when it happened three years later, then uh, when the deal was done, uh, about three months later, the parliament brought a new law, changed the original one, uh, telling against now it, it is allowed again. Uh, to have advertisements uh, and posters on the lampposts uh, in, in Budapest. Uh, so uh, it meant that during the hunting phase, they practically destroyed the value of the company with a concerted action, with a concerted action of the Ministry of Economy, Ministry of Interior Affairs, uh, uh, the parliament, 
the parliament, the chief attorney's office, and the tax office. So all these organizations work together as a criminal organization under the leadership of the chief patron, or at least, uh, at least with the permission of the chief patron to have uh, such a complex, a complex action. Uh, uh, this, means, uh, this means that the amplitude of, uh, of the coercion is really wide because contrary to these simple corruption cases, only the chief patron and the criminal state is in a position that in one action, such a wide range of public organizations, uh, state organizations, state organs, uh, uh, could take part and behave as criminal actors. Such a thing happened with the case of uh, slot machines in Hungary as well, where, uh, uh, where with a law, in Hungary there was about uh, 20,000 uh, restaurants and uh, cafes and other places, clubs where slot machines uh, were operated. Uh, they paid taxes to the, uh, to the state, but uh, then the state with a law uh, the parliament obliged the owners to uh, uh, technically modernize uh, uh, the whole operation, as a result of which uh, the number of uh, these slot machine operators from 20,000 uh, was diminished to 2,000. But even following this after a year, they brought a new law with, with which they prohibited to have slot machines outside in these, uh, in these restaurants and cafes and so on, uh, local, local institutions all over the country. And they gave the monopoly of having slot machines of seven casinos in Hungary. And these casinos, uh, five of them were, were given the concession of this, uh, uh, was given five of them, this concession was given to, uh, to an oligarch very close to Orban and Two of them in the countryside in Debrecen, to another was which, which was given to and was tied to uh, uh, to a uh, Fidesz politician, high level politician from from Debrecen. This is also a uh, also a uh, an action where the executive power with governmental decrees. Uh, 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 the Ministry of Finances and the Parliament uh, all together is operated as a criminal, organize, a criminal organization. Uh, uh, now I will speak only about the uh, independent uh, 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 gas station, based gas stations in Hungary, because it's a brand new example, brand new example. About 25% of the, of the gasoline uh, is, uh, is sold in Hungary at such gas stations which do not belong to any big uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, companies. So this is what we call now uh, family-based gas stations. And when the government now introduced uh, um, uh, 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 official price, uh, officially fixed price for the gasoline, where the uh, retail price uh, uh, was fixed on a lower level than the large-scale price on which uh, uh, these uh, uh, the owners of gas stations could buy these uh, 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 gasolines. Uh, uh, it meant that uh, uh, in on every liter of the of the gasoline, it, this small gas station sold uh, sold to the buyers, to the uh, car owners, uh, uh, caused about ten percent uh, uh, loss and deficit for the for the owner of these uh, gas stations. Now this is the hunting phase practically the hunting phase within uh, re, uh, using the pandemic situation and the, and the rocketeering uh, gas prices that how, or how can uh, the government organize, organize uh, the uh, property change uh, in these gas stations and creating such a situation that while the big or uh, uh, oil companies, oil and gas companies uh, uh, can bear uh, uh, these restrictions uh, for a few months. Uh, uh, within a half year, most of these family-based gas stations uh, will go into bankruptcy and being able to, being able to hunt, 
to be hunted down uh, by uh, uh, by those oligarchs who are close to the to the to the to the government. Uh, these examples, all these examples, shows when practically there is an interinstitutionally wide horizontal and vertical cooperation amongst the, among state bodies. These are uh, 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 these actions cannot be explained within the frame of the traditional corruption. These are not corruption type act activities uh, uh, in these uh, in these businesses. Uh, uh, um, there are there is no kickback money practically, uh, uh, but other other ways of uh, advantages are uh, advantages are taken and where the government and the and the uh, whole state is operated like a criminal organization the last example what i would like to uh, tell you it's also a, a typical and a brand new one and the very large scale one i would say uh, uh, mainly using eu funds uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, there was a huge project uh, where the, where the government told that there will be about 1 billion foreign or oh, 1 billion euros uh, 300 billion forints for developing the Balaton, Lake Balaton region, uh, which is the uh, well most uh, uh, most popular uh, holiday uh, uh, region uh, in, in Hungary, but uh, uh, even uh, declaring that they will start this project, they they haven't started it until the property relations are not changing this region. Now, uh, uh, using this scheme of predation, you can see that uh, uh, what are those different, uh, uh, different types of properties, uh, pubs, wineries, spas, adventure parks, uh, uh, hotels, restaurants, campings, et cetera, et cetera, which are around, uh, around Lake Balaton. And this little map shows, shows the, uh, the change uh, the change of the owners uh, in the last uh, few years uh, 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 in, in, in their case uh, around Lake Balaton, where most of the new owners uh, uh, are, uh, they belong uh, very closely to exactly to the family of Viktor Orban or just to the wider political family of Viktor Orban. The stalking phase of this uh, of this process was uh, 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 when they tried to estimate that uh, uh, that is uh, how much state subsidies uh, uh, and EU funds can uh, uh, can can be driven uh, into this region. The hunting phase was when the large number of beaches, hotels, ports, and facilities had been acquired, taken over by the new owners, by the with the help of the with the help of the <clears throat> Uh, state uh, state led coercion and the consuming phases is very important when they just uh, 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 lifting regulations for example at, in the case of campings uh, uh, to allow hotel and resort building in campaign places uh, or lowering taxes or or there is directed demand uh, which uses state funds uh, uh, just to uh, uh, just to have uh, uh, to, uh, that the capacities of these hotels should be used uh, uh, economically, uh, uh, economically during uh, uh, during even the pandemic uh, pandemic time, and uh, uh, to show uh, uh, the concentration uh, 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 of these uh, of these subsidies and uh, and donations from the side of the states, uh, uh, you can see that uh, that. Uh, 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 Two thirds of tourism subsidies uh, from these huge projects uh, uh, went to the half percent of the applicants, and these applicants were were linked uh, uh, mainly uh, to to Viktor Orban. So, uh, just this last is, uh, uh, last example shows that uh, that the uh, uh, traditional framing of corruption. Uh, is practically not usable. These things, this uh, the operation of the criminal state is practically a, a, a blind spot for for uh, not only for for a, uh, for a lot of analysts, 
but even for uh, for the EU's and international organizations, uh, Transparency International, and others who, who who try to measure uh, the uh, uh, the level of corruption in certain uh, countries and to create scales for uh, for comparative researches, because in the case of uh, uh, of a criminal state, it can happen that the so-called traditional forms of corruption uh, uh, are diminished uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a country uh, because they are not needed for a criminal organization uh, at the top of the state. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the so-called unauthorized corruption or uh, that corruption which is, which is not organized by, by them directly uh, uh, they fight against it and uh, and and they punish it and uh, and uh, those fields of traditional uh, those fields uh, uh, of activities where the traditional corruption was widespread even can be whitened uh, by the predatory state because they do not need that forms of corruption to uh, to act as monopolists of corrupt activities. Uh, in a certain country. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I'm now coming back and uh, stop sharing the screen now. Thank you very much for this enticing presentation. Many, many thanks. I'll give the floor to uh, Miklush for uh, an assessment of the paper being presented. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation and for the paper. I think uh, Mira shared the paper, hope with everybody. So, so uh, I will talk also about the paper and not only about the, the presentation. I just tried to make the zoom smaller that I would like to see my notes. Okay, so uh, the, the, so thank you very much, uh, both Balint, uh, for for the presentation. I, I think it was full of full of very important thoughts. Uh, the most important strengths of the paper, but I think it it is the theory building. So if if you know uh, their uh, bill. Uh, and read the book and read the paper, it's, it's very clear that, that our art authors uh, would like to make a theory on, 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 on predation in our region, the post-communist regimes and understand uh, the system and understand the way it, it works. And, and, and that's quite rare uh, at the moment in the literature. So, so it's, it's, it's really an innovative paper uh, that they uh, made. The other strengths of the paper, but I find that it, it's clearly embedded into the theories, uh, and they are working on the theories which, which are important. Lisa's paper was mentioned, and Professor uh, uh, Wahabi's uh, paper and book was also mentioned. Uh, to be honest, uh, I think the, the theory of, of Mirdad on fugitive and curative assets can be even strongly embedded in the, in the theory. And, and, and we have more opportunity to use uh, the typology of assets that uh, we have established, the uh, appropriability and, and mobility of the assets. Uh, I would like to uh, also uh, uh, suggest some other literature. I know that, that the doctors know them, but maybe we, we can use them and discuss them later. Uh, one of them is the Botkin and Lisa paper on institutional stickiness. So what, what for me was the missing point, to be honest, uh, one of the question was why actually it's happening in the region. In, in their book, they talk a lot about that, but in the paper, not. And, and one of the key issues uh, I would be very interested in is, is why it's happening and, and and we talk a lot about foreign institutions, check and balances, uh, uh, European Union money, and all, all that such things. 
but 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 to be honest, I have the feeling that informal institutions and culture are, are extremely important to understand uh, the, the topic we are talking about and what's happening uh, nowadays, not only in Central Eastern Europe, but in a bigger part of the world. And and institutional thickness as a theory, I think it's 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 very useful. Uh, the other theory uh, which I would suggest to think over is, is, uh, is Wintrobe, Robert Wintrobe, uh, if I'm right, economic theory of hybrid regimes, because he's talking about whether the system can be sustainable or not. Uh, and I think it's a crucial point. Uh, uh, he said that it's, it's, it's a sustainable system. I, 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 to be honest, I disagree with, with him, but nevertheless, the idea that he suggests that there is a trade-off of loyalty to the strongman uh, and, and question on minorities is very important. The third theory, which was not mentioned uh, in the paper, but to understand the, the, the whole political economic situation in the region is, is, is the inform, uh, informational autocrats, but we have. Uh, the article was published in Journal of Economic Literature or something, like, or perspective, I don't remember. Uh, the question is why they have election. And, and, and the misuse of information is a, a key point that, that, that why, Hungarians uh, or Russian people are let the elite do what they are doing. And in the article, actually, we learned a lot about the elite. We learned a lot about the strongman. We learned a lot about the oligarchs, uh, those who are uh, owning the, the companies. But actually, the mass, the, the, the incentive of, of the people who are voting, I think it was a critical point. Why they are not acting? and let people, the elite, do what they are doing. Uh, the fourth one is, 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 is Kordai, that he's, he, he talked a lot about. So to understand the situation now, this you should dig deeper in the socialist system and understand the coordination mechanisms that Kordai suggested to think. Uh, so these are the theoretical background, which, which I would uh, suggest to the author to be deeper. I know they already made it in the bigger book, uh, but still in the, in the paper, if they go further, then it would be, I think, useful to use these. About the methodological issues, it will be, again, okay, not something new because I discussed with, with both Balint already with the problem, and they know. This that that of course it's a theoretical paper, but the M underpinning empirical analysis is based on the case studies. Uh, that's not robust, to be honest. And, uh, excuse me, Miklush. Sorry to interrupt yeah. you. Uh, there is a small noise, uh, a constant small noise when you are talking. Is it somehow related to? Uh, Nobody is in the room, to be honest, with me. Uh, so I'm alone. Uh, I don't know because uh, uh, I listen permanently to a noise. Is it the same for yeah. others? Yes, I don't know how, how. What can I do? Yes, because I'm sitting in a in a in a room which is okay. Uh, nobody is here, so it's it's okay. maybe coming from my computer. Can you understand? Maybe. Even though that it's noisy, we can understand. We can, I can understand, but there is sometimes a slight yeah. problem. With you know following because noise sometimes you know um, oh your your voice yeah because maybe it's because of my laptop is it's, it's an old one and it's noisy it's heaty it's uh, too much heat maybe sorry for that but I, I think not, uh, I the noise is in in your microphone is in in your but I don't use any microphone yeah. just... oh. there is something in your uh... okay. Uh... Try to mute. If, if you cannot understand me, just tell me, please. But, uh, okay, so the, the theory, so, so, so the case studies, I think that's the biggest problem for all of us because I also researching on that and, and we're looking for cases and we understand the cases, but how can we make, so we need more robust empirical research on that. 
uh, which is not easy because measuring the problems we are facing and the authors, uh, 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 it's not easy. And also the demarcation problem we have here as well, because uh, Balint mentioned corruption, corrupt state, captured state, criminal state, but, but how we measured and how we can put countries into these groups, typology, that's, that's, that's not easy to say. Uh, and we can make a big debate on these. Uh, the other point I would like to mention in, in the methodological phase that, that uh, it's actually a theoretical paper focusing on, on, on the timing, the days not nowadays. But we need a dynamic analysis to understand why it's happening and what will be the result of this. So we don't need pictures or one picture, but a video. Uh, uh, and of course, this means historical background. And again, by coming back to the point, uh, analyzing the cultural background of these countries are, are crucial. Uh, Okay, and I have some questions uh, regarding the paper. First of all, and, and it's not only focusing on, on the paper, but for the research. So my real question, what are the main constraints of corporate writing? They already mentioned some in the paper. Bozoki, Andras, and Tagadush wrote a paper uh, that is extra, uh, many constrained by the European Union. Uh, or formal institutions are constraining it. Uh, uh, but I really interested in their opinion. That, so I, I find all of them, to be honest, uh, quite weak. Uh, but but I, 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 I think it's, 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 again, the informal institution which really constrains. So the society, whether they can accept uh, the full uh, full appropriation from the elite or not. Uh, and I have the feeling that, that actually the Russian and the Hungarian or the Kazakh society is the real constraint or not constraint if, if they accept everything. Uh, I already mentioned that, that for me, the most important part which I miss is, is, is the society itself. So why do you accept this? And the incentives of, of the people to be so not interacting with the elite and not giving them feedback anymore. And it's happening in Hungary is the same and almost many, many post socialist countries. You can say, of course, there are some in Kazakhstan, but, but I'm questioning that it, that it was the society in Kazakhstan and not two groups of the elite was actually have a fight. Uh, there, uh, so it, it it's, it's really focusing on the elite, and 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 I'm I'm quite curious about uh, the opinion of the authors why we are accepting this as a society. Okay, uh, the other point <clears throat> uh, which I would like to share uh, uh, share with you is 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 populism. So it's, 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 it's a political economic uh, paper. And I think it's, it's quite clear that those leaders who are making this predation and became a leader of such a hybrid state uh, or, or criminal state is, is, is using uh, populism. So the, the, is it enough to have populism? and to, to, to make a sustainable predatory state uh, in this region uh, using nationalism and also some part of the welfare state uh, and, and, and uh, to stabilize the system. Bela uh, Breskovich and Dorothy Bula is actually telling this, analyzing the transition that most of the countries are using these two things, nationalism, or the uh, latter state ideas as a tool. The other point which I would again interested in uh, that that if we are looking around in the post-socialist uh, countries, not everybody is turning to be uh, 
a predatory state or, or, or different kind of patronal autocracies emerging and some countries are not. And it's not fully connected whether we are close to Russia or not. So gravitation theory that the big Russia is actually uh, those countries which are close to Russia is, is becoming uh, following the big, big uh, uh, beer. Uh, that it's not to think about uh, Estonia or the Baltic states, and even uh, Poland is, is, is not Hungary, not Russia. So why is it that we have so many different kind of system in our region? The next question I would like to raise uh, to, to Balin, that if we look at these countries after the transition, for instance, Central Eastern European countries, Visegrad countries, first they became liberal democracy, at least they looks like liberal democracy. Palit uh, Magyar was part of the government and who established the democracy in Hungary uh, previously. So he knows well what I'm talking about. And, and it, 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 it looks like that we were capitalist, the full fledged capitalist system. And then it turned away and Orban was able to, to change change the game. So what, what kind of incentives they used? Uh, I'm sure that there was inside happening something in the countries, like in Hungary, we know the best in the Hungarian case. And but from outside, I was telling my, my idea, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, Balint knows it better both of them, I think. One of them is, is your chain, the talking in 2006, which may be changed the behavior of the society and the financial crisis. And it's happened together in Hungary, but, but they know, I, I'm not sure. So I'm, I'm interested in their uh, ideas about that. Okay, and the other, maybe the last point, uh, for me is the time dimension of the actors. So in the article, they said that, that uh, oligarchs or those who are connected, a part of the elite and connected to the leader, accepting that the property rights will be safe as long as they are loyal. But to be honest, I'm not sure that you, so if you are rational, it's very risky for long run that, that that the leader will not change their mind. You, you do, never know whether he will change or not and take away the property. And it's have a huge effect on productivity and innovation capacity of the given uh, economic system. If it's true that the time dimension is much shorter than we think, they will never invest in product activity, productive activity and innovation activities, but take out the money and maybe investing abroad. And I have the feeling now it's slightly starting from the Hungarian elite to, to invest abroad and, and not hold the money inside the country anymore because they don't have enough trust in the system. And maybe the system will be stable, but you know, the leader can change the mind. Putin can change the mind. Orban can change the mind, who will be the part of the elite. Okay, and, and whether the system is sustainable, this predatory state, yes or no? My question is, do we need uh, asset from abroad? Which means in, in Russia, it's, it's never abroad from, from outside of the system. I mean, for Russia, it's oil or gas. Kazakhstan is the same. So you can predate on that. But for Hungary, and it's a special case because it's, it's the European Union who is financing the system. And, and maybe the German big companies, to be honest. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's not a real sustainable system if you don't receive money from abroad or we don't have some specific asset like oil. Okay, I stop it here because I have raised many questions. And uh, thank you for listening to me.
Thank you very much, Miklush, for your uh, you know multiple questions. The good thing is that uh, I think we uh, you know the question raised can uh, contribute to the progress of the whole project because I think in a way we are all thinking about the same direction, and the question raised by Miklush are rather you know um, to give. Um, to raise food of thought for Balint and Balint uh, about uh, in the same line of research that they are doing. I am really interested to know their answer. You can uh, you know, um, react to uh, questions raised for say 10 minutes and then we will give the floor to the public. Well, thank you very much. And, and uh, I, I would not promise that we will answer all these questions because I think most of these are answered in our book, but the book is 800 pages. So, so I, I won't tell the whole thing, but <clears throat> I still try to focus on a few ones. Uh, the first is uh, the question of why, why it happens and how, it, uh, how can it happen? Uh, in our book, uh, uh, the major thesis is, uh, is, is based on that thing that we say after uh, Klaus Hofe, that, uh, that in post-communist regimes, uh, there was a, a huge difference between the countries concerning uh, the degree of the separation, separation of spheres of social actions historically, historically. And I think that those questions that uh, why Kazakhstan uh, differs from uh, Central Asian countries, from, from Russia or, or the Orthodox uh, Eastern Europe, and why they differ from the uh, Western um, uh, uh, Western Christianity uh, 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 used uh, uh, other former uh, former Soviet republics and Soviet uh, Soviet model uh, uh, countries. Uh, this is the real uh, uh, real dif uh, real difference. When uh, that Estonia, uh, 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 the process of the separation of spheres of social action pol actions, politics, economy, and uh, and communal life was much more developed, and the and the relation of these spheres, uh, the relation between these spheres, was much more formalized and transparent than it was in uh, uh, before the Soviet times in Central Asia or in, in the Orthodox uh, uh, world of Orthodox Christianity. Of course, I would not say that there is a past dependency, a, a, a determined past dependency because of these facts, but there is a Stochastical, stochastical uh, uh, connection uh, uh, of these facts and and what happened, what happened after. Uh, if the spheres of social actions uh, uh, are not separated, then in the, in those countries, the emergence of patron client networks uh, is going on much more easily. This is the cultural, sociological, anthropological tradition on which these are based. But the question that to have a criminal state, then you need the monopoly of political power and you need one patron client network, one patron client pyramid in a monopolistic position where you can destroy all others. This is, this is tied relatively closely with the situation whether these post-communist countries are presidential countries, presidential, uh, they have presidential political settings or not. Uh, uh, Hungary in this respect is, a, is an exception I, would say, exception, I would say. But to have, to have, uh, 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 to create the monopoly of one single uh, pyramid patronal network, uh, for example, uh, in Hungary, you needed two things. One is a very disproportionate election system, uh, uh, which, uh, which made it possible that even uh, uh, in the collapse during the crisis of 2008, 2009, uh, one single political actor uh, with 53% of the votes could say uh, a super majority, 67% of the seats in the parliament. And the other thing is that uh, we did not have a divided executive power uh, as another constraints for the monopolization of power. So um, uh, uh, we were not a, uh, 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 such a system where there would have been a 
real division in competences between the president of the country and the prime minister and the, and the, and the government. This is why I will say that, that, uh, that uh, <clears throat> the motives and the social, uh, uh, social background of Bulgaria, uh, Romania, uh, uh, Slovakia uh, uh, would have the uh, uh, predestination to become a, a mafia state like Hungary, like Hungary, but they had they had a proportional election system which hampered to have to have any of the patron client networks to get into a monopolistic position. And this is why in our model we call these countries countries regimes patronal democracies. They are not democracies, not liberal democracies, not democracies in a Western term. A patronal democracies for us means that uh, there are competing patron client networks and none of them is in the situation uh, to uh, subjugate the other ones totally. And of course, they can have different colors. Uh, colors, I mean, they can be left wing or right wings. From this point of view, doesn't matter because I think that if in Romania uh, uh, would have been a, a disproportionate election system, then either Basescu from the right side or uh, Ponta from the left side uh, would, uh, could be able to create such a system what we have in, uh, what we have in Hungary. Uh, uh, the, the, other, uh, the other question is that, uh, that why people accept this because there is a vesselization, vesselization, patronization, a patronization of the society, and in a patron client network, they become dependent. While the liberal critics of this country is dealing only with the fact that the separation of branches of power is abolished in these societies and in these autocratic, autocratic, half autocratic regimes practically like in Hungary or in Russia, uh, in a presidential country, um, the chief patron controls legislation, executive power, and, and the, the attorney's office uh, and the judiciary system, etc. Uh, but at the same time, they do not uh, 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 pay an attention for the opposite type of development that within the adopted political family, the chief patron separates the branches of resources. It means that, for example, in the Hungarian uh, uh, patronal regime, patronal regime within or uh, under the umbrella of Orban, uh, 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 clients of this uh, adopted political family, they can have either a position within the Fidesz but at the same time, not in the government, not in the economy, not in the media, or they can have a position in, in the government, but they are uh, deprived from any strong uh, uh, party background in this case, or they are oligarchs, but in this case, they do not have, they do not have position as a, a, as a government people in the executive power or uh, or in the party, or they can have media power. So why this, uh, why the uh, separation uh, of formal institution, uh, branches of formal institutions uh, in the political uh, realm is abolished? At the same time, uh, uh, those positions, which uh, uh, what you would need to be a real challenger of the chief patron, they are separated uh, very strictly, uh, very strictly in, this, in these regimes. This can give a kind of stability of these regimes. When we are speaking about the resources, of course, uh, it's, a, it's not a regime specific feature in our model, it's a country specific feature. When we can say that, uh, that our gas fields uh, or oil fields uh, are the EU funds. Uh, uh, and of course, this is the main problem for the EU leaders that how to negotiate with a criminal organization because it's diplomatically it's not so easy. It, it needed a lot of time until they realized that they are in, in, in one family uh, with, criminals, with criminals. Until now, 
they uh, they uh, carried out enlightenment programs, you know, towards the Hungarian government, where they wanted to help them uh, to organize anti-corruption fights. This was something like when if you try to convince a lion to be vegetarian, and then the educator, you know, is eaten eaten at the end of the course by the lion. So before uh, uh, Orban destroys totally with his friends as a blackmailing coalition, you know, of autocrats and half autocratic regimes within the EU, the EU now, I think, the EU uh, uh, wake up and, uh, and, uh, and somehow fears that uh, uh, they have fight for their life uh, and they have to face the problem of having a criminal state uh, within their ranks. Um, I, would, I would just like to uh, reflect on a, on a single point because Bant has uh, uh, reflected on many other, and this point is a time dimension that uh, Miklos raised, that uh, the time dimension of actors, that uh, we say that property rights are safe until people are loyal, but this might not be enough for everyone. Well, uh, and that's uh, that's actually that's actually true. And here I would like to make a difference because this leads to a very important differentiation between systems which are uh, single pyramid systems and systems which are multi pyramid systems. So there are very where there is one uh, chief patron who can uh, who has this maximum amplitude of arbitrariness, which Barney talked about in the presentation, and therefore can dispose over property relations single handedly. That's one model. And indeed, in that model, uh, oligarchs don't feel very good, even though they are beneficiaries of the system. I'm not saying that we should, uh, we should, uh, we should feel for them. I'm just saying that uh, they, uh, uh, it is a, they would much, much prefer a multi-pyramid situation when there is not a single actor who can move the entire system and the entire uh, uh, organ, all the organs of the state to take over their property if they are disloyal. So this is a crucial difference between single pyramid and multi-pyramid regimes and the security of property rights in single and multi-pyramid regimes. And also another differentiation in this regard, because you say that uh, because of the, uh, uh, this kind of predation, many of the uh, um, entrepreneurs leave the country. So many people, so innovative forces leave the country. And uh, this, this is a divide between oligarchs and the innovative enterprises or the market enterprises. The oligarchs get in their position by political favor, by patronal favors, and uh, their position depends on the, uh, the, um, well, the sustainment of their, uh, of their privileges, of their privilege of being, uh, uh, of being rich, basically. This is what the Russians say, that in Russia there are no billionaires or people working as billionaires. Who can be dismissed by Putin uh, at any time. And, uh, but on the other hand, there are the innovative entrepreneurs who are, as we know, they are uh, uh, headstrong people and they don't like, uh, they have a poor uh, 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 tolerance for dependence, a poor tolerance for, giving, uh, for being given orders by someone. And uh, therefore, they, uh, they do not want to be in this system. They would, they of course, leave this kind of system. And uh, it's not without a reason that uh, most of the people in, uh, in, a, in the patronal networks, they, uh, they are not at all innovative enterprises. That they usually, when, for example, in Hungary, there is, a, there is an actor called Lurinc Mészáros, who basically lives singly uh, or uh, only from uh, from uh, um, so he receives his companies receive income yeah. income only from EU funds and only from state uh, public procurements, basically. So like ninety percent or something like that of his income is from that. And when he goes to to export, when he goes to other countries, he fails miserably because of course he is not innovative. He has no real product for the market, but he is inside the rapid political family. He's very loyal. He is, in fact, the economic frontman of Orban himself. And that's why he's provided all these, all these resources um, di directed by Orban himself to him through the state machinery. So this is, a, this is another divide between oligarchs and the, and the uh, um, innovative, innovative enterprises. Yeah, that was, just, uh, that was just one point. Of course, there are a lot of many points and 
which uh, which you have raised and uh, like why the paper talks about the elite and not the people and where are the people in this whole stuff well we had to be concise as Brian said so many of these questions we have this book I, I'm, I'm grateful that in the chat it appeared uh, the link to it to the anatomy of post-communist regimes that's uh, that book is open access you can download it for free uh, but it's a it's a long book so we won't have time now to, to discuss all the finer points, but uh, but you will find uh, you will find the details the details there. Thanks. Thank you very much for your response. Now the floor is open for eventual uh, remarks or questions. If you wish to raise, please do not hesitate. You can write your name in the chat section or uh, just show your hand by raising your hand. So uh, we always take three to four people's you know intervention and you can lob together and then we will give the time to you. There will be time also for a second round because there's almost uh, 30 minutes left uh, in case in the first uh, cycle, we do not uh, finish with all the questions and remarks. Now, if there are any, if there is any person who is uh, volunteer to make remarks or raise questions, In any way, I have written my name on the list uh, and I will uh, raise some questions, but uh, I will wait a little bit. Okay, Emma. Yes, thank you. Would, would you like also to ask questions or make points? Yes, should I write also your name, Philip? No response. Okay, Emma, please start. We will see whether Philip also would like to have an intervention. Yes, thank you very much for a very insightful presentation and discussion. Um, I just wanted to maybe ask you to expand a little bit on the question of uh, nationalization and transit nationalization, because you also mentioned the takings. Um, so do you, I mean, how do you, how do you situate yourself um, in the theory that you propose uh, regarding this idea of taking into public use? Um, I mean, how is a white rating different from that? Because I, from the reading, I haven't, um, I read the paper, but maybe not uh, in sufficient details. And I should also read the book. But I'm not at all a specialist of the post-communist uh, countries, but I, I'm interested in mainly Latin America. So I actually find some interesting uh, bridges maybe to build. And I was wondering, I mean, if you talk about transnationalization, how is it different from um, centrally led corporate rating? And in that regard, how do you, I mean, do you totally disagree with the idea of North that the state can be personal versus impersonal? Um, yeah, so that, sorry, my question is maybe not clear, but just if you can situate yourself. Thank you so much. Other questions, remarks? Yeah. Philippe, please. Well, well, it's a short, short question. I, uh, uh, I, I think that it is better that we say, for example, three, four people, and then we will give the, the time to you to react all the questions and answers. Philip, please go ahead. Okay, thank, thank you, Merdal. Thank you for your very interesting presentation. My question is about what you call by uh, arbitrariness. You have a specific and I think normative definition of arbitrariness because many things are arbitrary but do not uh, lead to corruption, uh, abuse of authority, or a criminal state. For example, driving uh, on the right or the left is arbitrary, but not criminal. Uh, or universal time, the way to say in hello, all is arbitrary. Here, arbitrariness is in a weak sense, uh, and that means that there is another decision that is just as good or would uh, to do the job that could work. 
in your presentation, it's uh, different. Arbitrariness is a strong way, uh, in a strong way, is used to disqualify a policy or a decision. Uh, can you elaborate this point? Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip, for your question. I have a few remarks and also say question, but it is in the, you know, in the borderline of remarks and questions. Uh, if there are any other person who would like to uh, register for the first round, please do not hesitate. We take four people's questions and remarks, and then we will pass, uh, you know, the floor again to our uh, speakers. Now, first of all, let me tell you that really your project is a very fruitful, fertile, and innovative project. And I really sympathize fully with uh, what you are doing. Yeah, really, it is a very rich uh, you know, uh, perspective. Now, I have a few remarks. It seems to me what uh, is important in your analysis of different type of state is that in fact, we have not just one state. We have more than one state. There are parallel institutions. I uh, found it in my research that parallel in institutions is very key to understand the logic of predatory activities. And as you discuss, especially your you know, um, examples, illustrations, show that there is not just one state, there are several forces, you know, and we do have a kind of parallel in institutions. I totally understand what Miklush says about informal and formal uh, distinction of formal and informal rules. He is right to mention that. North uh, emphasized this point uh, clearly, and I think it is very important, but I think it is not sufficient. It seems to me that there is really a problem of parallel institutions, and especially in the way sovereignty is organized. And I think even the word mafia state is not sufficient because uh, the underlying point in the mafia state is that there are parallel institutions. And in fact, the regime is both position and opposition. You know, the problem with type of parallel institutions is that the frontiers between who is in the regime and who is out of the regime is, becomes very difficult. In a sense, you know, we, we talk a lot about populism and the way you know, a populism works with the established regime. But I think there is, again, a problem of parallel institutions, which permits the ruling force to behave both as part of establishment and anti-establishment. This is one point which I would like to make. I think that the way you distinguish different type of corruption is very interesting. But it seems to me we need to introduce the idea of parallel institutions to make sense of this different uh, establishment or anti-establishment position which we see. This is my first remark. I have a second remark, and it, is, it relates, in fact, to uh, the issue which was raised also by, uh, by uh, Miklush about sustainability. Uh, and you also talked about the horizon. The, I think it seems to me that the behavioral regularity of economic agents is key to understand what happens next. And the time horizon has its importance or impact with regard the behavioral regularity. I owe this point to Janusz Kornak, who understood how soft budget constraint shapes the behavioral regularity of socialist so-called enterprises. Now, I think economics of predation is somehow related to economics of escape. And escape is a real behavior. There are many, many dimensions, and I do not like really to uh, discuss different dimensions. But I think that one of the contribution 
of all people working on the economics of predation is that they cast light on the issue of economics of escape, which is a way to oppose. And this economics of escape does not belong only to prey. It also belongs to predators. Why? Because there is a paradox of predators. What is the paradox of predators? They are all prey in a multiple predator system, but they need safety. They have to keep their money or their you know, uh, cash money, their assets in a place to be safe. We have baron thieves. The thieves need at one point to be protector of property rights. And because of that, it seems to me that the way it impacts the behavior of agents, both prey and predator, is important in terms of economics of escape. This is my second point. And I will finish with uh, two other points. And the third point is about the path of investment or non-investment. Is it a trajectory of accumulation? I personally have developed, and I am working on it uh, in my new work, a type of development path belonging to predatory states. I called it patrimonial uh, development in which the emphasis is on assets. Now, the question which is raised again by uh, Miklush in his uh, uh, discussion is that what is the impact of all these type of predatory activity on the issue of accumulation of capital? This is really key to understand how mode of coordination, how type of regulation impact in, in fine, finally, the productive system. I think we need, uh, the questions which I am raising, I think we all share it. We all have to address this question. And my last remark is about the type of capitalism. It seems to me what you are describing is not exactly the way a market capitalism work. There are some similarity with the, with the so-called political capitalism. Do you think that this concept is relevant to understand at least partially some post-transitional period in communist, in ex-socialist countries? Can this concept be mobilized to explain some specificities of uh, capitalism during this transition period? Sorry, I think I have raised a few points and questions. I think that since there is nobody still in the list, we pass the floor to uh, Valint and Valint to have some response. But if you have other questions or remarks, Please uh, put your name in the chat part. Uh, it will be recorded for the second round. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the questions. Again, I think we won't have time to answer all of them, and, but, but I try. Uh, first, to Emma's question about uh, transit nationalization. Transit nationalization, uh, 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 transit nationalization is, is, is uh, 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 it has two causes why it is needed uh, in the predation of, uh, of, of, of certain uh, certain enterprises. One is if if the, the oligarchs to be elected to be the new owners, they do not have enough capital just directly in quotation marks to buy it. To buy it, uh, uh, this is why there is sometimes transit nationalization. It happened during the first Orban government already with this uh, with the palm chain, uh, which belonged to an oligarch who belonged to the, uh, uh, to the Socialist Party at that time. And, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and he was blackmailed, I won't tell the whole story in several ways, until, uh, until he led to buy this uh, uh, by the state, uh, the, uh, this network. And then this network was, uh, one or two years later, privatized to a friendly, oligarch, friendly oligarchs. 
but uh, uh, this happened, for example, uh, when it is needed, uh, when it was needed uh, uh, just uh, this year, uh, last year and this year with the ports at Lake Balaton, uh, uh, where uh, most of the ports were owned by the local governments. Then the local governments, uh, where there were a lot of uh, 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 such local governments which did not belong to the Fides, were not led by Fides politicians, they did not want to sell these ports just to anybody. Therefore, the state brought a law where uh, they artificially created a holding, a state holding, where it was compulsory to join with these ports uh, of, the, of the local governments. And when it happened, it had, uh, it, there was created a, a, a state majority, a central state majority within this holding, uh, for the expense of the local governments. And then they were privatized these sports to the friends of Orban Victor and to family members of Orban Victor. This is a transit nationalization, but there is sometimes just a reverse process, uh, transit privatization, what I call transit privatization, uh, when it happened also in the last years that, um, that um, uh, 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 and uh, energy plan, uh, uh, energy plant, uh, the biggest one based on uh, uh, coal and gas, uh, 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 which was owned by the state. It was privatized to Lurins Mesaros company, uh, uh, which is practically the frontman of Viktor Orban. Uh, uh, this guy within two years robbed out that company, and then uh, uh, and then the state bought it back. Uh, from a, for a higher price from Mesaros, so uh, they went there just uh, just rubbers rubbed out rubbed the company and then gave it back uh, uh, the racks to the uh, to the state. Uh, now uh, uh, the the question what uh, 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 what was raised that that why we call these countries mafia states we we, we just would show one. Uh, one slide, uh, one slide that uh, that uh, 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 we consider a state, a mafia state, because of uh, if in four dimensions they fulfill uh, the requirements being a mafia state. What is very important that the actor has the shape, the sociological shape of a clan, and then sometimes the literature calls these countries a clan state. The second, when, uh, the second question is that uh, when the action of this uh, state is uh, uh, concerning, uh, concerning its relation to power, then uh, and this is a, uh, <coughs> appropriation for private use of uh, state organs, then it's a neo-patrimonial or neo-sultanic state. The second is targeting the goods, uh, revenues, and, uh, revenues and assets of the state uh, 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 and even private persons, then it's a predatory state. And if it's going on a uh, on a non-legal base, then it's a criminal state. And if all of these uh, requirements are given, then it's a mafia state. There, uh, at the mafia state, we consider a subtype of patronal autocracies, because there are such patronal. We should say that uh, that uh, uh, all mafia states are patronal autocracies, but not all patronal autocracies are mafia states. For example, the Shagdoms in, in, in the Emirates, in the Persian Gulf, they are patronal autocracies. But there it's a legal system. It's, 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 uh, it, it does not have, a, have the cover of a, of a, uh, of a democratic uh, uh, institutional, institutional setting uh, uh, like in, this, uh, in, the, in these regimes. So this is why we call, this is why we call them uh, 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 mafias. And other question, what was raised by uh, uh, Merdad is the is the is the sustainability of the regime. Uh, uh, they are uh, uh, stationary bandits. They are not not simple bandits who rub uh, rub something and they they leave the leave the site uh, uh, with the prey. Uh, but they are stationary bandits, and therefore, of course, uh, of course, they need to. Uh, 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 to uh, uh, somehow to uh, uh, to keep up the regime and the regime and the system, 
but it's a balance, I think, a balance of, uh, of, uh, of uh, economic possibilities, uh, 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 coercive methods, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And what is the real problem of Orban that within the EU, uh, he is not uh, uh, free to use the means of physical coercion so openly as for example, Putin in Russia or, or, or other autocrats in other autocrats in, in, in Central Asian countries. And we have, to, uh, we have to say that while during the regime change, Hungary in its economic position belonged to the leading countries of the former, uh, of, of former communist, uh, communist regimes, now we are, uh, we are at, the, at the backyard and, and our relative position uh, uh, even in comparison with Romania, Slovakia, and the others, Baltic states uh, uh, was uh, uh, hugely, huge, hugely deteriorated, deteriorated, and uh, and uh, and we are uh, uh, just ahead of Bulgaria in most of economic uh, uh, economic. Uh, um, which are the, uh, econ in, in econ yes, economic development. So, uh, so, uh, so it's an other question. It, it, this is two questions: the sustainability and the, uh, let us say, the objective, objective uh, developmental uh, uh, possibilities, uh, possibilities of this country. I think that the, this uh, 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 in a mafia state, in a mafia state. Uh, uh, where the government, the, the, the state is operated like a criminal organization, uh, uh, they will never belong to the, to the winners of, of international economic, uh, economic competitions. Now, I would like to uh, reply to some, uh, what uh, so I would like to reply to some of the, uh, some of the questions. Uh, First of all, about, um, about transit nationalization, there was a specific question that how is white trading different from taking into public use? And well, uh, the, question, uh, the, uh, um, the answer is precisely that in the case of taking into public use, the, uh, the one who initiates it does not necessarily, is not necessarily the beneficiary of that takeover himself. So for example, a politician, let's say that there is a lobbying group, there is an interest group, and which lobbies for some taking into public use, let's say this. And they are interested in it, they would like to have some, uh, uh, they would see uh, this, uh, this uh, taking into uh, as a beneficial move. So therefore they lobby for it. And the politician therefore also receives something like campaign contribution. Now, in this case, taking into public use happens and the politician receives uh, campaign contribution. Then he uses this resource in the political sphere. He doesn't become an entrepreneur. The politician doesn't become an entrepreneur in this setting. Then the it is not the in the in the case of white trading. In the case of white trading, when the company is taken over, it becomes the de facto property of the politician. Here we are coming to Merdad's argument about the parallel institutions because formerly, of course. When, uh, when a company is taken over by these white trading means, it, it uh, doesn't become the former property of the, of, the, of the politicians, of the prime minister, for example. But informally, it will belong to the ownership orbit of his adopted political family. So, and this is the real, this is the real question, whether the beneficiaries are indeed the, uh, are part of the informal patronal network or they are not part of the informal patronal network, but maybe uh, some interest group members or, 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 or similar. So this is the real uh, distinction. Now about arbitrariness. So what we call arbitrariness and uh, uh, basically, and this, uh, this leads to the question of what we call corruption. And basically what we call corruption is that when there is a single official who is corrupted, on, a, on an occasional basis. Then that means that instead of applying normative rules, he will make a discretional move. He will make a discretional action. He will be corrupted precisely to, uh, to deviate from the normative rules and to use his own power, his own decision-making power, not according to the normative rules, but in a discretional way to prefer that 
single actor. This is basically, uh, this discretionality is what we call arbitrariness. But in this case, when there is a single person who is, uh, who is bribed, this is everyday corruption as Bonnie mentioned. And as we go up and up, then we are reaching a wider amplitude of arbitrariness when these kind of discretional actions can be done on a much larger scale using a lot more state institutions. So at the point of the criminal state or the predatory state, uh, as Bayan just explained, uh, the, the different uh, levels of the mafia state, in that case, uh, there, are, there is a, a, the whole range of state institutions at the disposal of the chief patron. And therefore, he can use these. He can use these to meet out uh, discretional punishments or rewards. He can use it to give uh, punishments or rewards personally, not to groups, not to classes, not to layers of society as a tax would be or a regulation would be, but to certain people, to certain companies. He chooses who should be rewarded and whose company should be taken over and given to whom. This is basically the kind of arbitrariness what we talk about. And uh, basically this uh, discretional action and the dominance of discretional action in the place of normative impersonal rules. Now, as, uh, as I already mentioned, we very much agree with, uh, with Merdat's point about parallel institutions, throughout formal and informal, uh, the adopted political family, how we define the uh, this, uh, political economic plan, which rules this kind of uh, paternal systems, we actually define them sociologically as informal paternal networks. So, and we detach them from the formal organization, which would be the party. Because if you think about a communist system, for example, in a communist system, you have a formal, a bureaucratic paternal network. There, that's also a paternal network, that's also a hierarchy, but it's also, but it's also formalized, that everything belongs to the party. Now in these systems, the oligarchs do not have to be party members. They do not have to belong to this formal organization. They have to belong to the informal organization, to the informal patron network, which then uses the state and uses parties and uses different institutions to their advantage. Now, and, the, and on the final point, that the thieves also need property rights because they might also become prey. And here is an interesting uh, and quite um, sad irony that uh, it seems that the proper functioning of criminal states requires the, uh, the existence of non-criminal states, because it seems that these criminal uh, actors actually uh, very often uh, uh, um, put their money and put their assets in, uh, in, uh, in democratic countries like London and, uh, or in uh, uh, the UK or France and other countries, they move their property there because the property rights there are secure and they are protected under the Western regime of property rights and the Western regime of, uh, so there the state cannot just take it over as it can be taken over in their own country or, or, in, a, in, a, or in Eastern other post-communist countries. So this is a very common pattern that these autocrats and not just Orban in Hungary, but also Putin, also his oligarchs, also uh, if you go to Central Asia in uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, it's also very, very common that they use uh, for example, the, uh, the, uh, uh, um, the, the luxury real estate market of London and many other places in the, what we call the global criminal ecosystem. And they use these other institutions of the global criminal ecosystem to basically to launder the money that they have and have it protected under Western regimes and Western regimes of property rights. So that's, uh, that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting thing. Thanks. Thank you very much for your responses. Is there any other question or remarks for the second? Although the time is almost finished, but we can always prolong, have an extension for the last questions if they are, if they exist. Any questions, remarks? Well, there is a, there is one question, sorry, in the, in the chat. I can see it. Uh, Miklos is... Yes question, what are the comparative advantages of the system? Because without comparative advantages, it cannot be stable for a long run. And I think this is the, uh, this is a key point that Bayant already mentioned, that we need to distinguish between the success of the country and the success of the patronal network. So, and, uh, and the sustainability of the country 
uh, as a whole and the uh, standard in, the, in terms of development and standard of living and uh, all the benefit benefiting of society on the one hand and the uh, advantages of uh, of the adopted political family in terms of keeping power and accumulating uh, wealth for themselves so we have to distinguish these two because indeed uh, in the uh, in the former case very often their tradition introduces uh, perverse incentives into the system, like driving out innovative entrepreneurs and, and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, this can provide a new kind of equilibrium, a new kind of system in which they can still hold on to power by marginalizing their opponents, by patronizing different sources of uh, different resources of power, as Bannett mentioned, which then cannot be used autonomously against them. And if they achieve this kind of status, they can achieve sustainability of their own system on their own terms. Not, uh, this is not sustainability or advantage on ter in terms of a, um, uh, a so social success, in terms of uh, normal public policy uh, thinking, but it is advantage on a paternal policy thinking. So th these, uh, these systems do not have real public policies. In fact, they have paternal policies and they do not have paternal public policy uh, motives only public policy consequences of what they did. Uh, I, I, uh, Jonathan also would like to raise a question. He, he wrote on the chat. Uh, Jonathan, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mardet. Actually, it was partially answered by Mr. Uh, Modelovic, but um, I'm just curious about uh, how they are, uh, how they address the issue of constraints from the state. I think that. There was a question that was raised also by uh, Mr. Rosta. Constraints from the uh, from the society, sorry. And I assume that you will mobilize ideology as uh, well in the literature of public choice, Randall Holcomb, for instance. He wrote an article about the ideology of uh, predatory states as well. So I imagine that in the case of Hungary is also uh, related to uh, nationalism as an explanation to, uh, to explain the low cost of predation for the Hungarian state. Just that, thank you very much. Just a few words. Uh, uh, we, uh, we made a difference in the process of autocratization uh, between three phases, uh, uh, autocratic attempt, autocratic breakthrough and autocratic consolidation. Uh, in the case of uh, when the autocratic breakthrough is done already, then it's very difficult to have a peaceful, uh, uh, to, uh, a peaceful way to turn back to democratic rules, and especially if the autocratic consolidation is done, is practically impossible uh, on, an, uh, on an electoral way to change uh, uh, to change the to change the regime. Uh, all those color revolutions, uh, what we saw in Ukraine, in Moldova, in the, in, <clears throat> in in Georgia, or in or in, uh, or in um, uh, North Macedonia, uh, uh, they were just around the phase of uh, autocratic breakthrough when, when one patron client network uh, tried to build up and to, and to get through and to create a monopolistic power. And, since, and even at that time, it was needed uh, altogether, I think, three basic motivation, uh, uh, three basic motivation to overthrow that regime. Uh, the, the, this is the economic backwardness or losses for the majority of the society, uh, the huge government level uh, uh, corruption, and the cheated elections. Cheat or, or, and if these three things came together, then uh, we could saw this. Uh, uh, we, we could saw these uh, uh, color revolutions. The problem is that uh, uh, these color revolutions creates uh, uh, cycles. Because, uh, because everybody is hoping that uh, a, a redemocratization process can be successful, but when this redemocratization process is not accompanied by an anti patronal transformation, then of course, again, again the, the, the new regime uh, under the democratic uh, surface, a new patron client networks uh, in power tries to expand this power and, and, and try to uh, subjugate other, uh, uh, other patron networks uh, uh, to itself. 
and then the whole process is started again. This is what why we saw this uh, cyclical character of these uh, of these uh, uh, color revolutions. For example, in Ukraine or Moldova or 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 or, uh, uh, or in or, or in other uh, other countries. So uh, <clears throat> in the case of uh, in the case of population, as Balin Balin mentioned, that if in a, a dominant patron client network. Uh, uh, can grasp a large uh, share of the society, uh, then uh, uh, then it's very difficult to get rid of uh, such a regime. Uh, Hungary is on the verge of this, I think, because uh, on one hand, I could argue that uh, with peaceful elections, it's impossible to change this regime. And on the other hand, maybe I could argue that maybe this is the last chance when where we are now. Uh, where we are now, because it's it's a clear case that uh, a clear thing that in the case, for example, in Russia, uh, you cannot imagine any kind of elections where an opposition could 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 win. Uh, we within the EU still uh, still on the margin of of, of 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 such a possibility, but it's not sure that it could be done. And if you ask that in this case, why revolution is not coming, you know, because 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 uh, the main characteristic of such a patron client network that that uh, uh, as you go as you are going at, uh, towards the top of the pyramid you have uh, 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 you are on one hand uh, you can be privileged on one hand but at the same time blackmailed on the other hand and these two things are are operating operating uh, uh, together and uh, as you go down in the uh, lower, uh, uh, lower strata of this pyramid, there the people do not have practically any possibility to organize, organize themselves and to step, uh, step up uh, 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 against, uh, against the power. Therefore, the, these, uh, these regimes, in spite of the discontent uh, maybe against them, uh, uh, could to some extent stabilize stabilize themselves. Thank you very much for all this discussion. Really many, many thanks. And uh, as uh, Miklush also promised us, we will be having the pleasure to listen to him, his work. Uh, and um, I hope that this uh, exchange will continue in the future also for the works of uh, Balint Magyar and Balint uh, Medelovic. Uh, and I would say that I would like to say that our next session will be held on April 8th, uh, and the speaker is here, uh, Eleonora Gentilucci, uh, who will be talking about uh, the military apparatus, military structure of the United States. And uh, the discussant will be Rone Bole, who is expert in this field, in the, the military structure of France, and also uh, US. Uh, she had worked a lot about uh, uh, the complex military and industrial complex in the United States. And uh, many thanks uh, to organizers and Jonathan who organized, in fact, the, the session. And also we will be having this uh, record and also uh, your promise to have uh, the PowerPoint, what you showed so that uh, all colleagues who were not uh, able to attend uh, could profit uh, of what you did. Many, many thanks. Thank you very much for the possibility of being with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.